continue through the study in the Word of God. Coming off of the Wednesday night Amos study, if you guys have a chance, guys, that's been really great. And, you know, we have almost a, a, as big or a bigger turnout on Wednesday nights. Don't ask me why, but uh, the study through the Old Testament has been good. And you can kind of think that, hey, we, we, we ran through Jonah. We, we didn't run th so quickly through Jonah, but uh, well, now we went through Amos. And I had a hard time even finding Amos in my Bible, to be truthful. <laughs> And now it seems that, you know, I just flip the, uh, I just uh, grab a bunch of pages and it just opens up in Amos, it opens up in Acts. And wherever you are, it seems that as you study God's Word, God is just taking you right to the Word. And I, I love that because, you know, as a new believer, I would always be flipping through the Bible saying, i got to find what this guy is talking about. <laughs> and I didn't have those tabs, see, so I would flip through the Bible and, you know, Get to know the Word of God and get to know what God's Word is speaking to us. Amen, guys? Let's pray one more time. It's, it's a great thing that we come out and pray and uh, good prayer time on Saturday morning. And uh, what a blessing. Father God, we do want to thank you again for the opportunity you give us that we might come and worship you, Lord. You're such a great God, Lord. Such a gracious God and so loving. And uh, We kind of thank you that... Uh, you, you, you're even more gracious, Lord, and it's not more like uh, uh, in the times of Ananias and Sapphira, which, you know, the couple we looked at last week, Lord, and uh, uh, we, we thank you for your grace and your mercy and your favor for our lives. Your tender mercy is new for us each and every morning. Bless us as we continue through, again, now the study of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Guys, you know, we just mentioned uh, in our prayer Ananias and Sapphira, but last week we looked at the lives of this couple, Ananias and Sapphira, and we, were, we looked at, the, at them with great fascination, you know, the lives and the characters. You know, we looked at, uh, in our study through the Gospel of John, you know, in our recent studies, we looked at the life of Peter with great interest, and with John and James, and we looked at Mary and Martha. We looked at Lazarus, but we looked at men with great fascination and amazement, like the high priest Annas. Man, Annas had everything going for him. He had this high position, and he just loved all the things of the respectful greetings and the places of the seats of the banquets of honor, and, and he loved all that stuff, and he loved all the, the money that would be coming in uh, because he got a take of all the profits, that, of all the merchandise that was being sold in the temple court. And you, you kind of think that, hey, this guy had everything going for him. Entrusted to him was the oracles of God. And yet he used it specifically for uh, the enrichment and the, the, the love of power, the love of the respect of the people. Last week we saw, you know, we saw this husband and wife, Ananias and Sapphira. They together conspired against the Lord to deceive their fellow church family members. It was kind of like, wow, we, we, we want all this good stuff. They saw this guy, Barnabas, the son of encouragement. He sold a piece of property. He brought the money in. He laid it at the feet of the apostles for the needs of the church. And, you know, there was no great fanfare. There was no great accolades. I, I believe this guy, Barnabas, was just a humble guy. He was without guile. He just says, hey, I got this piece of property. I can now give it up and give it for the use of the Lord. And he just laid it at the feet of the apostles. And yet these guys, uh, Ananias and Sapphira, they, they wanted to receive the, the, the commendation and the accolades. They wanted to think that, wow, these guys are so spiritual. This couple is such a great couple. And they feigned their generosity. They, they said that we're going to sell this piece of property. And we brought it in. And uh, uh, they loved the thought that people would, would think of them so highly. And, 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 and yet they harbored a, a love of money and wealth. And really what it was, the sin was pride. The prideful things that they say, we want all the attaboys, we want all the good jobs, we want all the things of the people thinking that we're such great people. They love the, the, the honor that they desired for themselves. They wanted to be honored. They wanted to think that, again, people think so highly of them. But the spirit we saw dwelt swiftly with this like, hypocrisy. And in all of this, we saw that uh, the continued working of God through the hand of the apostles 
we're accomplishing much here in uh, Acts chapter 5. We'll pick up the study here in verse 12 of Acts 5. And at the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people. They were with one accord in Solomon's portico. And, th uh, and through the hands of the apostles, guys, many attesting miracles were taking place. Hey, guys were getting healed. Guys were getting saved. Guys were getting uh, uh, relieved of whatever burdens and maladies that they had. Uh, but there was no, there was no refuting. There was no infighting, no jealousy. <laughs> There were no taking sides, which it was commonplace today. And even back then, we saw in the church of Corinth, as Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, the guys were saying, hey, I'm of Paul, uh, I'm of Apollos. And they were, they were taking sides, and they were saying, hey, my church or my leader is a better leader. My thing is better. Our ministry is bigger. Whatever it might be, there was a lot of things of commonplace, you know, infighting, jealousy, and just saying, hey, I'm... Uh, 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 my father's tougher than your father, like, you know, kind of thing. You know, like when you're a kid, you know, I don't call my brother, you know, and he's going to beat you guys up. And, uh, but none of, uh, none of the rest dared to associate with them. However, the people held them in high esteem. Notice what happens here, guys. There was a reverence or a holy fear uh, uh, that came over the people for these men of God. As the Lord validated his ministry through their hands, you know, the people kind of associated that hey, their God is a mighty <coughs> God. And, you know, we better treat them with a little bit of uh, respect. They're not, they're not serving a common God. They're not serving that idol down, down the street on that corner that, you know, ha has, uh, has no expression, doesn't move, and doesn't seem to do much, that little idol. But people were respectful towards the servant of God. And, you know, at times, uh, people can help... Uh, hold the people of God in contempt. They could say, oh, you Christians, oh, you lousy guys, it's all your fault. Or they could be uh, like the Jews. Uh, uh, people have blamed the Jews for many years. We just saw what happened, uh, you know, 70 years ago, 80 years ago, where they said that hey, if we just wipe out the Jews, everything is going to be good. And there's a movement right now that says, hey, if the Christians would, 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 would uh, leave the scene, everything is going to get better. And uh, when, when the church is raptured off this earth, guys, the proponents that, that have that theory, they're going to say, oh, all the bad vibrations are gone. All these Christians, they're out of here. And look at all the money they left behind. Look at all the possessions they left behind. And uh, we're going to have a field there. We, in fact, we're going to throw a party. It's kind of like when the prophets died uh, uh, in the book of Revelation, the two men of God that came to prophesy over the earth. They were giving of gifts. It was like a holiday. It was like Christmas. These guys died, man. We're going to give gifts and we're going to have this party. But again, you know, it, it, it really equates to, hey, where are you at with the true and the living God? How do you respect them? How do you treat them? And, and again, uh, a representative of God were, were, were his people. So the people here, they said that, wow, these guys are serving the, the a mighty God, a true and the living God. And, and, and we don't want to mess with them because we don't want to end up like Ananias and Sapphira. There was a holy fear, a reverence for the working of God. Uh, the people held the servant, the servants of God with respect and high esteem. And, uh, and all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number to an extent that they even carried the sick out onto the streets and laid them on cot cot cots and pallets so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on any one of them. God was doing a mighty work and the fledgling, fledgling church began to grow in numbers, guys. With the advent of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, this would signify the beginning of the New Testament church. Here it is, guys, and we're an extension. We are. Uh, an outgrowth of the New Testament church and God has been growing his church and doing his mighty work in this world for the last 2,000 years and remember that we've uh, we've often read on uh, Communion Sunday this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood uh, the new covenant in my blood see the old cup or the Old Testament was the law that says a hey, you shall not kill. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not covet. But this new covenant in Jesus, uh, speaking for his death on the cross for all mankind, he says, you are saved by grace through faith, that not of yourselves, 
but it is a gift of God. In other words, we couldn't earn it, we couldn't merit it by keeping all the, the laws, the lists of do's and don'ts, but it was only because God was so gracious that he gave us this gift, this little gift of faith that we could say yes to him and come into the family of God. This new covenant uh, through the blood of Jesus Christ, guys. Here, uh, uh, here the high priest rose up along with all his associates, that is the sex, sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy. See guys, there were two categories of the priests. There were the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and not normally in agreement with one another, but at this particular juncture, they came together filled with jealousy. Hey, they were united. They were saying that hey, our way of life is being threatened. Our way of community is being turned upside down. The Romans might be looking at us and say this is the beginning of an uprising. They might come down. They might uh, come down hard upon us. And life as it is, life as good as it is right now, might be turned upside down as uh, the Romans could see this moving of, the, uh, of God as a threat uh, of uh, insurrection by the Jewish people. But the, um, they, these guys were filled with jealousy, guys. And the King James translates this word jealousy as indignation or envy. Hey, they were envious of what God was doing. They were filled with indignation and saying, hey, how could these guys do these things? You know, uh, These religious leaders were not happy with what was going on in Jerusalem. The people, uh, the people were, were falling over slain in the spirit. And I'm really speaking about Ananias and Sapphira, guys. And I'm taking a pot shot at those guys that on TV, that, you know, uh, the people are falling over on TV, which is, that's not nice, but uh, uh, I couldn't resist that cheap shot, guys. Others are being healed of various illnesses and maladies. And the working and the moving of God was undeniable. But uh, worse yet was the people regarding this work of Jesus' apostle with high esteem. They said, we just thought we got rid of this Jesus. We got the Romans to crucify him. And, and now we thought we got rid of him. And now, again, it's happening all over. It's even greater than working of God. You know? <laughs> they laid hands on the apostles and put them in public jail. When an angel of the Lord during the night opened the gates of the prison and taking them out, he says, go your way, stand, and speak to the people in the temple the whole message of this life. Uh, the religious leader's reaction was to immediately incarcerate the men of God. I like that word, incarcerate. I tell people, I, I, I often tell you guys that when I call the hospital to check on somebody if they're there, and so on and so forth, I asked the person, I said, do you have such and such a person by this name incarcerated there? <laughs> Like you're in jail, <laughs> they got you captured, you got, you, you got nowhere to go. <laughs> I was in the hospital the other day reading to a guy who last Sunday, he received the Lord in the hospital. Last Sunday received the Lord, he was going under the knife, under the knife and the threat of death was upon him and he says, yeah, I'm scared, man. And I, and, and I, I, told, I told him about one of the other brothers who had received the Lord. And he prayed to receive the Lord right there in his hospital bed. Everything got quiet. All the people in the room, some of them left the room, some of them were just sitting there quiet. As I prayed with him, he prayed the sinner's prayer. And, uh, and you know, later this week, a few days later, he came out of the surgery alive. And, and, and the first day he looked bad, the second day he, he got a little bit better, his voice came back and he looked a little small and the next day he looked, you know, less, he looked more normal and stuff like that. And, and uh, I, I, I came, I sat, we, the nurse scolded, scolded me because I didn't put a hospital gown on. She was nice, but she said, hey, next time, you know, you're going to put that, gar that, that, that gown on, it's right there on the bottom of the the tray outside the door on the rack, yeah. And I, okay, okay, and, uh, uh, but I, I, I stood by his bed and I opened the Bible and, and I started to read from him uh, out of Psalm 149. And I kind of thought that, oh, you cannot get up and run now because he was so resistant to the word of God before. I don't want to hear it, get away from me. You're not coming to visit me, nothing, you know, I don't want to hear it. 
he would barely answer my phone calls. Most of the time, he wouldn't answer my phone calls. And, and, and Sunday, receiving the Lord, Monday going under the knife, three days or four days later, I'm reading to him. And I say, well, you cannot, I was thinking, he cannot get up and run. <laughs> and sometimes when you're incarcerated by the Lord, God captures your heart. God captures your heart. You cannot get up and run. You cannot go over there and say, hey, Russ. I've had guys like that say, hey, stop. Why well, I've had guys say, hey, you can't kind of preach here. And maybe you guys have too. And yet we, we, got, we got to do what we got to do. Because the Lord tells us, go your way, stand, and speak the whole message of this life. It's kind of like, hey, God has given us a chance. God has given us an opportunity. And most of the time, we have this fear of man. We choke. We say, hey, we don't want to make A, A, make A, you know. And, you know, we, we kind of think that we're going to be embarrassed by what people think or what people say or how they react. They might react badly. They might say, stop right there. Or they might say, hey, enough. Get out of here. And, and, and yet... You know, I, I look at the, uh, the apostles, the gates of the prison opened up. The, the, the angel told them, go your way, stand, and speak to the people in the temple the whole message of this life. And you might say, hey, Russell, I, I, I'm not like you. I'm not a lippy guy or whatever it is. But, you know, we know John 3.16, we know that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. We know of his love. We know of his forgiveness. And sometimes God just opens the doors. And it's like kind of like we were in prison, guys. We couldn't speak. We couldn't do anything until we came to that saving knowledge of Jesus. And as he opened the prison doors for us, he set us free. He says, now you're going to be my agents out in that world. He says, go your way, stand, and speak to the people the whole message of this life. And it's kind of like we have this opportunity, guys. We have these so many moments and days and weeks and months of our life and you know how do we use that do we do we just kind of hang on to it or do we look for times hey lord are you giving me an open door to go ahead and share the gospel and some for some it's easier than others some it's a real step of faith and others are you know god wants to just uh, give us a little bit of gentle persuasion that we speak the whole message of this life Upon hearing this, uh, God's message was simple and concise, guys. Whatever he tells us, he tells you and I, whatever assignment he has, it, 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 uh, it very well may be specific to you. You know, you can reach people that we, we can't reach, you know. You can reach people that I can't reach. You can reach people that uh, only are specific within your realm of influence. Or it might be for a moment, you might be speaking, sitting next to a guy on the airplane, or you might be sitting next to a guy on the bus, whatever it might be. I don't know what that is, but what God's will uh, for your life is, that is, guys. And, you know, I know that God's will is that we would uh, share his love with others. And I don't know how and when we're going to do that, how and when. But sometimes I know that he says, hey, when you open your mouth, I'm going to give you the utterance. I'll give you the words to say. Even though it, it sounds like garbage, it sounds uh, garbled and so on and so forth. But it might be as simple as this goal, where he directs, stand, stand firm for the Lord, the love of Jesus Christ, and continue to speak the message of life. We have the message of life. Where, where can we go? Peter asked the Lord, for you have the, the words of life. So as we become those filled with the words of life, we can convey this simple this message, this message of life to others. Here in 21a, and upon hearing this, they entered into the temple about daybreak, and began to teach uh, without hesitation guys oh uh, they didn't say let me think about it or you know what the biggest cop out is let me pray about it <laughs> sometimes uh, sometimes when some you know uh, guys uh, they ask me oh Russell can you go visit my friend can you go visit my friend's father in the hospital or blah 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 can you go do this or do that I try and go right away because you know why? I'm like most people, I procrastinate. I say, oh, maybe tomorrow will be a better day. <laughs> maybe later. I should say this uh, when the dessert comes around. Oh, maybe next time. Maybe later I'll have that piece of cake. 
by the way, we enjoyed all that good cake for the, the last so many weeks, guys. But whatever it is, without, they went without hesitation. They, it was not, let me think about it or pray about it. They went, they went extra early. It says that they went at daybreak and, you know, they couldn't wait to fulfill the assignment of the Lord. And sometimes it's good because, you know, you never know when that opportunity is going to come up. Next time your, your way might be blocked, the opportunity might be blocked. Uh, here we continue in 21b, and now the high priest and his associates uh, had come, and they called the council together, even all the senate and the sons of Israel, and sent orders to the prison house for them to be brought. And the officers who, uh, who came did not find them in prison, and they returned and reported back, saying, We found the prison house locked quite securely, and the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened up, opened up, we found no one inside. And when the captain of the temple guard and the chief priest heard about uh, these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, so uh, as, uh, as to do uh, as what would come of this. And when somebody, uh, when they came and reported to them, behold, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. The captain went along with his officers and proceeded to bring them back without violence. For they were afraid of the people, lest they should be stoned. And when they had brought them, they stood them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in the, this name, and behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. After convening a meeting of the rel religious hierarchy, guys, they love their meetings, and they love to get together, and they love to plot their dirty deeds and you know we, we know that uh, back then when Jesus was alive they said that hey we're going to make this agreement we're, gonna, we're not going to rest until we can put this guy to death but they were startled here to find out that the f prisoners were gone the doors were secure uh, uh, and no one was inside and you can kind of think about that wow nobody's in there how did they get out the guards are out here what happened the priests were quite befuddled over all of this, especially after hearing that the prisoners were back in the temple teaching the people. You know, how is this miraculous things? Can God lead his people through solid doors and solid walls of places of incarceration and places of imprisonment? Yes. Yes, he can. Guys, uh, you know, metaphorically speaking, many of us were just... Uh, locked in into those pl places of incarceration, those prisons. And God set us free. God led us right through outside those doors that tried to hold us. But the power of God uh, could not be thwarted as he led his people out. They were back in the temple teaching. How is this? Uh, uh, they, they must have thought, how is this? And how could it be? Let's bring them back, but uh, let's take care of the people riot. See, the people were already... Uh, they were having great favor with the people. The people were saying, hey, this is a this is a great moving of God and these men of God, how dare you guys, uh, you, you better treat them nicely, was the thought of the people. The thought of the religious leaders, they said that hey, they get a lot of backers, man. The people are backing up, packing them up. The religious leaders were in a conundrum and, and uh, here was a real move of God, guys. Here was a real move of God. You're not gonna stop God. Once his, uh, once his uh, move is going, well, how are you going to stop him? It was irrefutable, guys. The people were drawn by the Holy Spirit. They couldn't deny the things that were happening. Miraculous things were going on. Prisoners getting through the solid walls of the prison and the locked doors. Yet they tried to exert their authority over the apostles. We gave you orders, they said. Now look at the disturbance you're causing. Here again, they're blaming the, the apostles and they're blaming the, uh, the apostles for the zeal of the people. And this is the disturbance you're calling. But Peter, Peter and the apostles answered, they said, we must obey God rather than man, verse 29. And Peter uh, draws the line here, you know, we've considered what you say, we heard you guys, but uh, how, can we, how can we disobey God? And you know, this is where the line is, you know, like uh, Pastor Chuck would say, if they make it illegal to preach the gospel of God, uh, when you send me the cake, put a file in it because he's gonna be in prison. <laughs> in other words, they're gonna have to imprison me because the word of God is still going out. Send me a file in that cake because I'm breaking out to continue <coughs> to preach and teach the word of God. 
one day, you know, we might get close to where it might be considered a hate crime to try and make a convert. You want to give your life to Jesus, oh, that's a hate crime. You want to give your life to the devil, you want to give your life to Muhammad, it's all okay, it's all good. You want to give your life to Buddha, but in the name of Christ, uh, Jesus Christ brings offense to the world. And we're, we're, we're pretty close to that, guys. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. And this one whom God exalted to his right hand as prince and a savior, grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness for sins. And we were witnesses of these things, and so, the, so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Peter again recounts the, the, uh, the, the story. God raised up Jesus. You know, here is the heart of the gospel. Jesus Christ crucified. Jesus Christ buried. And Jesus Christ ra being raised up on the third day. God was exalted. God has exalted him as a prince and savior. And here uh, uh, he's the prince and savior. In Acts 3.15, he's the prince of life. In Isaiah 9.16, 9.6, he's the prince of peace. He's the prince of peace. And you see that this word prince speaks of originally, ori originating or beginning. It doesn't say you're a ruler or you're a junior to the king, but the word prince means originator or beginning or founder or author or prince or leader. See, this prince speaks of the one who was there originating things from the very beginning. He was the founder of all things that we know. Uh, he is the author of all that goes on. He is the author of perfection. He is the author of our faith, of Jesus Christ as the ruler, guys. He's the prince or he's the leader. Also appropriate uh, of Jesus, guys. The word savior here in uh, verse 30, 31 says, he simply a deli he delivers or he is a preserver. He delivers or he's a preserver. He gives all life and breath to all things, says W.E. Vines. He is the savior and preserver of the church of the body of Christ, guys. You know, it's kind of like when we dr were drowning out in that ocean. It's kind of like Jonah when he was in the belly of the beast as the great waves swept over him, as the cords of death encompassed around his neck, the seaweed and stuff like that. And, and, and uh, it's like he called out, and here the preserver was thrown, and here that life preserver. Who was that life preserver? It was Jehovah God, man. It was the Lord, the King of Kings, the Prince of Peace, the Prince, the author of life, guys. And he's the Savior and preserver of the church. As the Prince and Savior, he comes to give repentance or to bring us to a change of one's mind and purpose. You know, our purpose at one time was kind of given over to our own way, our own will. And some of you were good guys and some of you were not so good guys. <laughs> some of you were kind of rotten guys as a matter of fact. And that word repentance says that he came and he changed the purpose of our life. He changed the direction of our mind and our purpose. And we kind of were de redirected away from the way we were going and directed to him. All of this for the nation of Israel and for, for, for the forgiveness of sins. As, the, as, uh, as uh, the good news would come to Israel, it would eventually come down to all the world, uh, to the Gentile uh, nations. Uh, we were eyewitnesses, Peter testifies before the council. Take note, Peter shortly before Jesus' Jesus's crucifixion denied vehemently to a servant of the high priest, a servant girl of the high priest, now he's filled with boldness, the boldness of the Spirit, simply telling all these high rulers the truth of the gospel. He choked when that young servant girl came and says that, hey, you're surely one of these men. He said, no, man, no way. He didn't want any part of it. He denied everything. Three times he denied the Lord. And now, now he's filled with the, the Spirit of God. He's just saying, hey, this is, the, this is the, the truth, man. He's the way, the truth, and the life. This is how it, how it is. And when they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and they were intending to slay them. Isn't it just the, the way the world is? Hey, let's snuff them out. Let's quiet them. Let's, uh, let's off them. And you know, these are the religious leaders. And these were guys that were plotting. They had murder in their hearts. They said, that, hey, we can just kill this guy, man. We'll just arrange some kind of accident. We'll cut the brakes on his brake lines on his chariot, and he'll go right over the cliff, man. <laughs> 
you know, it's kind of like in the movies, you know. You hear about those stories of a guy, his wife died mysteriously in a car crash. Wow. <laughs> wink, wink, they're going like, hey, we, we, something else was going on. But you know, they heard this, they were intending to slay them, and a certain Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, respected by all the, the people, stood up in the council and gave uh, orders to put the men outside for a short time. He said to them, men of Israel, take care of what you purpose to do with these men. For some time ago, Theodos uh, rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a group of about 400 men joined up with him. And he was slain, and all who followed him were dispersed and came and came to nothing. And after this, uh, this, this man, Judas of Galilee, rose up in the days of the census and drew away some people after him. He too perished. And all those who followed him were scattered. And so in this present case, I say to you, stay away from these men. Let them alone. Uh, for if this plan of action should be of men, it will be overthrown. But it is of God, you will, will not be able to overthrow them, or else you may even be found fighting against God. Wow. Uh, prudence and wisdom ruled here, guys, as Gamaliel, who we're told was a teacher well-respected by all. He was a teacher, he was well-respected by all. He spoke a calming word to the rest of the council members. If, if, if uh, it's of God, he says, you will not be able to overthrow it. It's, if it's a move of man, it will be overthrown. In other words, you can't fight God. You can't buck God. But if it's just a bunch of rabble following after man, it will be overthrown. Uh, overthrown. Gamaliel turned anger and wrath with reason to a more logical conclusion, guys. And here this, uh, this Pharisee, this leader, in fact, he, he was a well-respected guy because even Paul sat under the teaching of Gamaliel, we're, to, we're told later in the book of Acts. And Paul was considered a, a pretty uh, mighty man of God, you know, as far as the law went and so on and so forth. But Gamaliel showed a lot of wisdom and a lot of temperance here as he turned again the anger, wrath, and thoughts of murder uh, to this more logical conclusion. Hey, let it go. And sometimes, guys, you know, we, we might be in fearful situations. Sometimes things go drastically wrong. And sometimes all we can do is we can say, hey, God, you know, this is way above my pay grade. God. I can't do it. I can't handle it. I got to give it over to you. And sometimes we, all we can do is just worship the Lord, you know. Sometimes God gives us a song in your mouth and a song to sing and uh, just a time of meditation in your heart and you you gotta pray lord may it be acceptable to you i don't know about you but sometimes uh, you might find yourself driving past that off ramp that you're supposed to take because you're kind of singing to the lord a song you're kind of dreaming and you're kind of just drifting away in worship and in praise and, and 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 then you say i just missed my exit i just missed my cutoff and God says, it's okay, there's, just, God, there's a turnaround up there, just go turn around. Don't try and cut across the freeway, the, the grassy area of the freeway. Go to the light and turn left, and there's the park over there. You can turn around and go back the way you're going. And sometimes we can't fight it, guys, and we got to let God do it. we got to let God deal with it. We give it over to Him. You remember I said, offer it up to Him. We can offer up the sacrifices of praise. We can offer up the things and the great giants, the great fears that come to overwhelm us, that come to bring fear and to bring uh, uh, that feeling. You know, the, the local term is scared. Not I'm scared, but scared, S-C-A-D-E. -E. And I see the bumper stickers. It says, no scared. Like, oh, I have no fear of nothing. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Oh, my God is bigger than your God, your strength. <laughs> but, you know, if it's God, you can't fight him. Uh, if not, it'll die out. And sometimes, you know, we give it to God, and God is going to fight the battles. We give it to God. He's our defender. We give it to God. He's our protector, our provider. And, and uh, uh, one way or the other, uh, we, we're winners in Christ Jesus. Amen, guys? Here they took his advice, and after calling the apostles in, they flogged them 
and ordered them to speak no more in the name of Jesus than release them. So they went their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they have been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And every day in the temple went from house to house. They kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Well, the religious leaders took uh, Gamaliel's advice. They released the apostles, but not before whipping them and flogging them and again ordering them not to speak in the name of Jesus. What was the response of the apostles? They went their way rejoicing, having counted, uh, been, been counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? They didn't go whining and crying and say, oh, I got spanking, I got whipped, look at my, you know, I've been brutalized, let me call the ACLU, let me get my attorney because I've been wrong. But they said they went their way rejoicing, even in the hardship, guys, in the hard, difficult times. These guys went rejoicing. And you know, most of the times we, I, I, I gotta, you gotta say that most of us, we're kind of these whiners, you know. And somebody once said, what, what is that? And they said, well, that's the wine, uh, that's the cheese for your wine. <laughs> like the guy was saying, hey, you're a whiner, huh? <laughs> and, and again, they went there rejoicing. They were, they were uh, arrested, they were jailed, they were set free, they were brought before kangaroo court, they were beaten and given orders on what they could and what they could not do. I think if you want people to do something that you know, if, if you want them to do something, just tell them, hey, you cannot do it. <laughs> you cannot do it. And then, you know, in their heart, they would say, yeah, oh, yeah, let me show you. I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. And they worked the opposite way. They said, you cannot speak in the name of Jesus. And then when uh, the, the gospel of Jesus went forth with more, much more power and with might. I think that's what happened in China, probably, guys. They said that hey, you cannot speak in the name of Jesus. Yet, all these guys have been for years taking Bibles and smuggling Bibles into China. Now you hear that what the gospel of Jesus Christ is going in through North, uh, into North Korea through China. And you say, wow, a lot of good things are going. The gospel is going. The churches are growing in the Middle East and behind the curtain of tyranny in countries like uh, uh, Iran and so on and so forth. When you tell the people you cannot do it, they went their way rejoicing, even though they were ordered, even though they were jailed, even though they were beaten. Under all of these threats, the gospel continued to grow. It, 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 I like what it says in verse 42, guys. Every day, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah. Great signs and wonders and miracles and great growth within the body of Christ comes through the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. God's word does not return to him void. That word of kindness, that like, like apples of gold and setting, settings of silver, is that word fitly spoken, just in that right time. Like a cup of cold water, you speak that word uh, that, that brings refreshment to a life that's dried out and parched. Guys, it could be just that little word of encouragement, that little word of hope. Like Barnabas, the son of encouragement, we can be those encouragers. We can take the little steps of saying, God bless you, I'm praying for you. We can take those little steps of saying, I don't know how it is, but it must be real tough. I'll pray for you. Can I pray for you? You know, Whatever it might be, oh, this is what the Bible says. Oh, there was a guy by the name of Jonah in the Bible. <laughs> Let me tell you about Jonah. <laughs> he ran, oh God. And, and you know, you, you can turn that little bit of bad, sour, bitterness, the, the, the what, what is a lemon? It's kind of like tart, yeah? But you know, like, again, God, God wants to take the lemons and make lemonade out of it, you know? And somehow the little word, fitly spoken, can just bring a, a world of encouragement to those out there uh, lost without the love of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for just uh, the amazing work of your spirit, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that even in the hardship and the hard times, the apostles went their way rejoicing, even after being arrested and incarcerated and beaten and ordered what to do and what not to do, Lord. Uh, 
they rejoiced in you, Lord. And we can thank you, Lord, and praise you. That we can say, hey, we rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say, rejoice, Lord. And we thank you for the opportunity you bring us, Lord. We thank you for the word of God, Lord, and how richly it speaks to us, Lord. And uh, we're so blessed and so amazed, Lord, as uh, your word reveals to us.